Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome. And uh, uh, very glad to have uh, uh, Furong Huang. She is an assistant professor in our department. Uh, she got her PhD at UC Irvine, uh, spent some time at Microsoft Research, and then joined us. Uh, Fu Furong's interest are in uh, deep learning theory, learning theory, spectral methods. Uh, she shares a love for mathematics <laughs> with several of us here. And uh, take it away, Furong. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Romani. Um, Thank you everyone for coming. I'm Farong Huang and I'm a faculty here. This is uh, going to be my seventh year in Maryland. I've had six wonderful years here. So today I'll be talking about trustworthy machine learning in an ever-changing world. So we live in an era of information deluge. Even the smartest may find themselves overwhelmed by the highly dynamic over time and the massive data stream they have to come up with to make informed decisions, whether it is driving at a very busy traffic junction or healthcare and medicine that concerns our high priority needs, or even you know, the large language model update that is trying to use some kind of uh, RLHF, RL from human feedback to align large language models with human and social value. So all these kind of decision making is interactive decision making. What that means is that what you do now is going to affect the future. So the decision making process is basically powered by machine learning algorithms is going to have a long term effect. All right. So for example, a large language model that is already aligned with your human value, you know, later on in return, these large language models may influence the human and social value. Subtly, or maybe not so subtly, but gradually over time. All right, so because of this, you know, ever changing world we live in, we always need interactive sequential decision making. But more importantly, we want the trustworthy machine learning algorithm to augment intelligence or to even automate intelligence, um, you know, for this sequential decision making in the ever changing world. All right, so, um, so for machine learning models to be trustworthy, I kind of wanted to have um, you know, a wish list of things. And three of the things that I'm going to talk about mostly is robustness, efficiency, and ethics. However, there are a lot of challenges to achieve the so-called you know, efficiency uh, in uh, interactive decision making. So we know that machine learning and artificial intelligence is now you know, in a terribly inefficient way in terms of efficiency, right? So for example, the foundation models that we're building is larger and larger, and you know, models getting wider and deeper. And if you just look at, you know, what the model sizes are compared with five years ago, it is essentially almost like 15,000 times increase, you know, in average. Well, so now machine learning models are also learned in this super inefficient manner in terms of data efficiency. So this is one slide I stole from uh, Tom Goldstein's Twitter, uh, which basically says that Lama, which is trained on 1.4 trillion tokens, is essentially 3,800 times more tokens than the average person might have encountered by the age of 50. So this is very concerning, right? So why are we spending so much computing on creating so-called artificial intelligence and machine learning? So can we do something better, right? So my group somehow is trying to understand whether these sort of inefficiency is necessary to create intelligence. And we want to understand, can we do things more efficiently, right? Can we have model efficiency? Can we have data efficiency? And can we have learning paradigm efficiency? Right? So the next thing we also care about is robustness, because that is, you may argue, one of the most important things to create trustworthy machine learning. So there's lots of success in this sequential decision making process, you know, as I'm motivated, that is necessary for this ever changing world. But all these success stories are essentially in simulators. You know, the very big, big success of Go games that are suppressing human experts 
you know, video games or even local motion tasks in robotics, they're all in simulators. So what happens when you actually deploy them in real world? For example, let's say you've learned a very good strategy in a simulator, but the reality is that the world is ever changing, right? So what seems to be very, you know, good in a simulator may not necessarily be good now in the actual real world. For example, you know, you may have a bad weather now and your simulator didn't necessarily, uh, you know, train these things in bad weather. So because of this distribution shift, you really are basically losing in this real world. Or even in the more extreme case, let's say you have an enemy mine or trap in the real world, which is not necessarily seen in simulators either. So you will necessar not necessarily succeed. This well-trained strategy may fail. So we need these adversarial robustness as well. So my group is striving to understand how do we efficiently adapt to changes in this ever-changing world in sequential interactive sequential decision making processes. And last but not least, I think my vision for you know, trustworthy machine learning is that these models should build in service of human, right? So it should be human centered. Well, when you're actually you know, deploying these machine learning models for these very important decisions in medicine, you know, in insurance, in hiring, in admission, you have to make sure that these models are actually conforming to social norms, right? So how do we do that is one of the biggest thing we need to think about and one of the things that my group is trying to work on. So overall, you know, this is just a snapshot of what my group has been doing over the last three years. I'll walk you through some of the highlights in each of these aspects, robustness, efficiency, and ethics. So um, in terms of efficiency, I wanted to highlight that the philosophy that we're trying to um, conform here is learning to scale. How do we learn to scale? We wanted to use learning to scale these machine learning models or even to scale the efficiency in terms of data and learning paradigm. Well, so I just give you an idea of what are the recent things we've been doing. We're really trying to kind of develop efficient machine learning algorithms that can even be used at the edge, which basically means that the device is going to be constrained, you have limited memory, you have limited computing, and you know, you probably also care about the privacy of your data. Right? So in terms of model efficiency, um, my group has been one of the first to understand model design for model efficiency. So the kind of things that we do, for example, the so-called tensor neural network is a very, um, you know, is, is an innovation to kind of replace the traditionally used linear layers with multilinear layers, which very interesting is kind of, you know, aligned with the transformer idea, which is using a second order information of the data. Okay, so here the tensor neural network arguably could be a generalization of transformer because it could use arbitrary order of the data. So, um, you know, therefore using this so called tensor neural network, we're able to achieve model efficiency in a very natural manner that, you know, your model is going to be trained to demonstrate the low rankness feature. But it's also, you know, using that, you can improve the design of the transformers. So, you know, it's very surprising that we found that transformers is not necessarily the most efficient architecture in terms of efficiency, right? Well, so not only that, we also kind of extended this idea to data that is no longer IID, for example, graph data that is intrinsically interconnected. All right, so not only model efficiency, we also care about data efficiency. So the things that we do, and uh, which is, you know, uh, very interesting that if you think about the data that you're dealing with, you're either in the big data regime or the small data regime. What do I mean by that? So if you have a lot of data that you wanted to learn from, you probably don't have the computing power to do it very efficiently, right? It's going to be super inefficient. So you're in the big data regime. It's like finding the needle in the haystack. Well, but you also might be in like the small data regime that, you know, in biological kind of uh, biomedicine applications, 
it's so expensive to collect high quality data, right? So how do you do that? So my group kind of under, you know, wanted to make contributions in both sides. You know, in the big data region, you wanted to do data condensation so that you condense the data that, you know, you know, making sure that your learning is most efficient on the data that really matters, okay? But also in the small data regime, we do data augmentation, right? So people know that data augmentation has been one of the most important techniques to make machine learning work. So in a very extreme case that you don't know what kind of augmentation you might do, very different from natural images that you just do like rand aug, like rotation and stuff like that. Here for medical imaging data, what kind of augmentation can you do? So we made some contributions there, and it's the first autonomous augmentation that you can do to drastically improve the performance in medical imaging prediction. So in addition to that, we also care about learning efficiency. As I kind of motivated here, wanted to do efficient machine learning at the edge, right? So you have the constraint devices, you also care about the privacy of your data. So what we did here, Essentially, federated learning come to play, right? Because you know you don't have to share your data; you can maintain certain level of privacy. But federated learning usually, you know, um, thought of as like a centralized setup where you have this single point of failure, which is the server. If your server is down, everything is broken. Your entire system is broken. So we wanted to realize that, and we wanted to do transversely machine learning, right? So what we did is we kind of wanted to propose a decentralized federal learning. And this is one of the first few work that is, you know, allowing asynchronous learning in this decentralized federal learning. So it's the truly distributed learning. And essentially, essentially this, you know, there is lots of challenges there. How do you make things more efficient? You know, how can you make sure learning converges on, under this asynchronous update? So, you know, in one of our work, we kind of, you know, propose the decentralized weight free asynchronous federal learning that is matching the state of the art convergence rate for stochastic gradient descent. All right, so just to give you a little bit idea of what we did in terms of model efficiency, here is a result we um, got for long-term video prediction. So you're using 10 frames to predict 30 frames and, and sort of using like, you know, the spatial temporal correlation here. So using this tensoral neural network, very interestingly, you can see that you can achieve the highest performance with the fewest parameters compared with other kind of neural network architecture. So this is sort of a promising result showing that maybe these higher order statistics might be useful in terms of, you know, making efficient, making learning more efficient. So in a more like traditional task of image classification, you know, on CIFAR 10 with uh, ResNet32 with like 460 k parameters, you can see that this tensoral neural network could almost have no performance degradation using like 10% of the, you know, 10% of the total number of parameters. So, you know, you can still maintain the high performance under very small models. But also, uh, we did some experiments on transformers using our tensor motivated architecture. Um, you know, theoretically, we can prove that it's probably guaranteed to have higher expressive power under the same number of parameters. But also in practice, we see, you know, using just 1.5% of the parameters, you could maintain 94% performance on transformers, which is very impressive. All right, so now I've talked about our work and it kind of gave you some highlights about our work on learning to scale. Well, what about ethics? As I said, ethics is the most important part of trustworthy machine learning. So what we try to do here is learning for social good. Specifically, I wanted to give you highlights about our work on fairness, but also we have some, done some work on privacy. So one of the things we realized that a lot of work claim that they've built fair models, right? But as I motivated at the beginning of this talk, we live in an ever-changing world. So there is always distribution shift. There is always evolving things that you have to deal with. There's always instabilities, right? So not very surprisingly, we find that what you claim to be fair may not be fair under distribution shift. And actually this is verified. 
right? So, you know, for example, what you learned to be fair in hospital A is no longer fair in hospital B, unfortunately. Well, so how do we deal with that, right? So this is a, you know, the under distribution shift fairness collapse, but in a more extreme case, if you have this evolving model in the sequential decision making process, every single time step is going to be a different distribution. What that happens, you know, not very surprising. Fairness would also collapse. So you know, we also kind of want, wanted to understand. Say you know you have STEM education, higher education, right? So you do resource allocation or these kind of things. How do you make sure that you have fairness over a course of time, right? So how do you make sure that this fair decision making is long term? Okay, so that's the kind of thing we do. So our group made some contributions in both sides. You know, in the simpler case of distribution shift, maybe just one time distribution shift, we designed a so-called self-supervised balanced contrast of loss. What that means is that you're going to use the techniques from self-supervised learning, but you have this extra constraint to make sure that contrastive loss is balanced across different groups you care about, sensitivity groups. And well, in terms of the more extreme case of evolving models, what we did is to provide additionally a unified long-term fairness metric. We can show that most of the existing work actually would fail, would have a false sense of fairness under that condition, and we wanted to fix that. And so that's what we did. So in these two works, we can see that we achieved the best Pareto frontier in terms of accuracy and fairness, under distribution shift, and also over the course of this interactive sequential decision making. Here are some results I want to show you. So, um, you know, you wanted to control distribution shift. And that's why we choose to first do it in a controlled data, synthetic data that you generate. What you do is you do this 3D shape data set. You can simulate various types of distribution shift. So, you know, under these many different types of distribution shift, for example, you know, you want to maintain um, you know, the color, but you just change the shape of the thing, or, you know, that's called a subpopulation shift, or you wanted to maintain, uh, you know, the shape, the scale, but just to change the color of the uh, object. Or, you know, in the domain shift, which is a more challenging case, that you've never seen bigger objects, but you will have to test those bigger objects in your test data. So also in the even more challenging case of a hybrid shift that you have some kind of subpopulation shift, but also in addition to that, you have domain shift. Under all these scenarios, you can see very impressively our method is able to transfer fairness and accuracy under this distribution shift types. But this success is not only in synthetic data, it could also, you can also see a similar result in real world data. So this is what we did in real world data for imaging, um, you know, from UTK face to fair face, you can see are also uh, achieving the best Pareto frontiers under this real data. So now I showed you, you know, what we did in terms of distribution shift. What about long term? What about long term fairness under the actual interactive decision making process? So we did some experiments and we kind of simulated our own world. Uh, we looked at the lending situation. We looked at the infectious <laughs> disease control situation. We also looked at the attention and location situation. So in all these three simulated environments, we can see that we are getting pretty good reward at the end and pretty good bias, you know, reduce, able to reduce bias. But more importantly, we're getting also the best Pareto frontier uh, compared with all the existing methods uh, in terms of reward and bias. Okay, so, you know, this is a recap of what we did in terms of ethics. And of course, you know, there are all, a lot of future works that we probably wanted to continue working on. But for now, let's move on to robustness. Okay, so in terms of robustness, I argue that is one of the most important, you know, aspect of trustworthy machine learning. Our philosophy here is learning to be robust. So we wanted to understand two different kinds of robustness. 
One is the distribution robustness. So it is just a natural shift in your data or natural shift of the world. The other one is going to be adversarial robustness. So I'll walk you through you know, our contribution to both of these distribution shift and adversarial perturbation. But let's start with distributional robustness. So one of the things that you know, people argue that machine learning models may fail is the so-called out of distribution data or data in the wild. Right? So in terms of that, we have some recent contributions to deal with out of distribution data. For example, very recently, we realized that because the data might exhibit some kind of spurious correlation, machine learning models might be fooled into learning such spurious correlation. For example, in this fruit data set, so you've only seen bananas in yellow, right? So you've never seen a yellow apple in your data set. So traditional machine learning models might be tricked into thinking that anything that is yellow is going to be a banana. But that's definitely not true. So what we try to do in our method is to do this so-called causally disentangled representation learning. What that means is that you know, under the very well-specified confounder, you are able to learn actually the true generative factor. You will understand you know, that the fruit type is determined by the color, by the shape, and by the size. So you are able to successfully recognize a yellow apple, even though this yellow apple has never appeared <laughs> in your training data set. So yet another idea we were doing uh, you know, in terms of this out of distribution data and making sure that we're resilient to spurious correlation is another work here that is trying to learn invariance to unforeseen spurious randomization. What do I mean by that? So machine learning models try to deal with this kind of spurious correlation by doing randomization. Right? So, you know, I can randomize my apple so that it actually has a yellow color. But is that always doable? So we argue that sometimes the sort, the sort, the sort of uh, spurious correlation may not be available to you. For example, 3D view. So you were given a 2D image. How are you able to generate 3D views of that image? It's not that simple. Or different poses of this image. So what we try to do here in this work is to be able to generate this unforeseen spurious correlation or this unforeseen spurious randomization so that we can deal with OOD data. All right, so yet very recently, because you know, this visual language model is so popular nowadays, we're also trying to understand it. One of the very maybe not so surprising result now is that you know these visual language models are very semantically aligned so they were able to recognize whether this is an image upside down or normal image right so so utilizing that we realize that if you give this large this visual language model a context that you know this image is actually upside down then the visual language model is able to do zero shot classification much more accurately. So we call this chain of thought of clip here. And that way, they were actually able to deal with spurious correlation much better. And therefore, you can do out of distribution learning. All right, so not only that, we also did some kind of you know, work in terms of understanding environment shifts in sequential decision making. Well, so the basic philosophy here is to reuse prior computing we had so that we can adapt to things more efficiently. So you could imagine what are the changes in the environment, right? So for example, you have a walk -a walk and you wanted to somehow reuse what you learned in walk -a walk to walk -a run, right? So this is actually the major uh, focus of the prior work is to understand this transition from, um, you know, from changing dynamics. So the state is going to be the same, the action is going to be the same, only the transition dynamics is going to change 
but it's actually not change, it's just the distribution shift of the transition dynamics. So we wanted to argue that, yes, this is great, but can we do more, right? So in the case that if you have like a robot that is trained using a vector of the angle or velocity of this joint, right? So can you actually use that knowledge to train a robot that has a perception, right? So then the input is not actually these vectors, but it's just the image itself. Or in a situation that you could imagine, you know, we often have sensor upgrades. So this is not rare, right? So you upgrade your camera, um, you know, you update from infrared sensors to camera and these kind of sensor upgrade. It happens all the time. So were you able to still also transfer knowledge there? So the answer is yes, but people weren't able to do it before us. So we were the first to be able to do this transfer learning across even drastically different observation spaces. Now, I talked about changes in dynamics, changes in state observations. What about everything is changed? Let's say you have a cheetah that is trying to, you know, learn what cheetah is doing, but can you transfer what you learned from that cheetah, cheetah to walker, right? So that's what we're trying to do. We wanted to be very ambitious in terms of reuse our computing. So one of the things we did like two years ago is to reuse samples. This was not done before, but it's actually very effective that you can find some modular similarities from the data itself, even if you are doing completely different tasks and local motion tasks. Very recently, we tried to build a foundation model. What do I mean by that? It's like a general artificial general intelligence model for robotics tasks or for sequential decision-making tasks in general. So what we try to do is to reuse the pre-trained representation and kind of transfer that encoder to make sure that learning is much more efficient on top of that representation. So I wanted to give you a little, more, a little bit more ideas about it. So let's say you have a lot of tasks, right? They're very diverse. They could have very different state space, different transition dynamics, or even different reward function. But one thing that you observe is that they are all perception-based robotics. Right? So they can have the same size of image observations. Now, the question is, are you going to always learn a new policy from scratch? You know, whenever there is a new agent, a new task, are you going to learn everything from scratch? Definitely not a good option, right? So, so then if you don't want to learn everything from scratch, what knowledge are you going to transfer? Right? So that's the question we're asking. And we argue that you wanted to do a pre-training such that you learn a common space that things become much more compact, right? So you wanted to learn the so-called control relevant representation encoder for any of the downstream tasks, even if it is something that you've never seen before, all right? So what do we do? Essentially, we, we're gonna use, again, the self-supervised learning paradigm. We're gonna design a self-supervised pre-training objective that is world model based, why do we do that? So first, I argue that it should be reward free because what you do now might not necessarily be true in the future, right? So if I'm gonna reach high, later on, I may want it to reach low. So using the reward uh, function, it's not gonna work. Now second, I want to argue that we live in the same planet, right? So the basic laws of physics should always be the same. Right? So unless you jump to another planet, that is a different story, but the basic laws of physics should be the same. However, there is all this complexity associated with it. Can you learn a common space such that the transition dynamics is somehow unified? So that's what we call a world model based per training. How do I do that? So this is a simple first attempt. We also have some follow up work later on, but I'm happy to talk about it offline. Here, what we did is to propose this control relevant representation objective. So first, what we're going to do is the forward dynamics prediction. So it is natural to think, you know, what is the good representation 
such that on top of that representation, you're able to predict the next state you know, of this taken action, right? So the forward dynamics prediction. And then naturally backward, can you predict what led to this state you are here? However, these two are basically the short-term control information. It's kind of saying, you know, what is the representation such that you are able to do one-step control, okay? But of course, you know, as we emphasize, we live in an ever-changing world, there's always this long-term information that you need to take care of. So this is what we did. In addition, in the third objective, we wanted to mask out a few observations and being able to predict them. Okay, so this is the long-term control information. So using these objective functions, we're able to learn a foundation model. And essentially this foundation model is just a common encoder, okay? Well, so what happens in the downstream, when you have a new um, task, when you have new data coming in, what you're gonna do is you're gonna append the policy hat to this pre-trained representation and you just need to fine tune the policy a little bit in the target task. So here's what we did in this DeepMind control suite. So we're gonna pre-train 10 tasks, right? So, uh, well, we're not gonna pre-train 10 tasks, sorry. We're gonna pre-train five tasks, right? Out of the 10 tasks. And then, you know, we're gonna test on some of the pre-trained tasks. But in addition to that, we're also gonna test on these other tasks that we've never seen in pre-training to see how it can generalize us to new tasks. Okay, so here are some results. First, we're able to show that this common representation is really helpful in terms of speed up the process, speed up the learning. So it's significantly improving the learning performance in the downstream task, whether it is within the pre-trained task or it is generalization to unseen tasks you've never seen in your pre-training step. What's even more exciting is that this so-called world model-based learning doesn't really require high-quality data in your pre-training, which is very different from how you know, OpenAI train uh, chat GPT, right? They need very high-quality data. Essentially, they need human annotators, but here you only need random behaviors to understand the world, which is not very surprising because, you know, you explore the world with no goal, right? You just understand the world. And once you understand the world very well, you're able to do any goal in a very efficient manner. So I think this is a really nice kind of property we're getting here, that you are able to obtain data in a very efficient manner. Okay, so, the punchline here is, you know, you wanted to learn this common representation for transfer, and you wanted to pre-training these representations to transfer knowledge to new tasks. So representation is the key to be able to build this foundation model for robotics and be able to adapt this interactive sequential decision making. All right, so I talked about, you know, distribution robustness. Now let's go to the more extreme case of adversarial robustness in this sequential decision-making in this ever-changing world. So what are the things we do? So the philosophy here, if you wanted to understand your enemy, you probably want to understand yourself first. So how do you understand the vulnerability of your agents, right? So we kind of consider perturbations of the agent's interaction with the environment. So why don't you be able to understand how an attacker is trying to modify your state of the agent, but also observe your policy, as well as being able to hear your reward, okay? But the attacker, to be fair, the attacker wouldn't know the environment dynamics because, you know, your learning algorithm also is trying to learn that transition dynamics there. So this becomes a sequential decision-making problem also for the attacker. So what do we do? In terms of it, like, you know, the attacker, we kind of did the first the poisoning online RL algorithm, which happens, you know, perturbation happens at training time. In addition to that, we also understand the agent's behavior during test time. So when everything is already trained, you have a 
well-trained policy, when you deploy it in the real world, how is it robust? What is the vulnerability of that? So we kind of, during the test time deployment regime, we kind of find the state of the art attack, which basically means we reveal the vulnerability of these decision making process, but we also find defenses against those adversarial perturbations. I'll give you more details for that. But in addition to that, people may argue, is it always realistic to assume that you are able to perturb the agent's state? What if that is not possible? So again, we wanted to understand the practicality of these attack models. We kind of understand the vulnerability of the sequential decision-making process from the interaction with the other agent. So that is totally realistic, right? So even under that case, it is possible that these agents in this multi-agent environment is gonna be malicious. If that's the case, what are you gonna do? So we propose the first certified defense in this adversarial agent situation, and we, our attack model basically go beyond the very traditional LP attack models in uh, adversarial machine learning. So this kind of adversarial perturbation in sequential decision-making process may have a profound impact in terms of robust large language models. For example, prompt attacks like prompts that overread safe functions of large language model may be related to this. Also, this noisy um, or even malicious RLHF human feedback may also play a role here. So we're hoping that our kind of understanding in this adversarial perturbation sequential decision making could help us build more robust large language models. But now I wanted to dig deeper into the test time attack and defense. I want to give you some background about adversarial robustness in general. And of course, you know, I believe all the audience is very familiar with how neural networks are vulnerable to adversarial perturbations. It's very you know, famous example of a panda adding in perceptible noise become a given with high probability, with high confidence that a very well-trained classifier will classify it as a given. But what about neural policies? You know, the sequential decision-making policies that's powered by a neural network, would that still be vulnerable or more or less, right? So we argue here this missed decision has not only changed the immediate outcome, but it also can have a profound effect in the future. So we want to understand whether this effect in the future could create more damage, right? So kind of be inspired, you know, the uh, art of war, that if you know yourself and your enemy, you will never lose a battle. So in order to know yourself, you know, to improve the robustness of the agent through defenses, why don't you first know your enemy? That's why we wanted to measure the vulnerability of these sequential decision-making agents by studying attacks first. So what is the attack model? You live in this world with the agent interacting with this world, right? So the victim is this well-trained neural policy that is deployed in this world. Right, so the attacker is gonna do a adversarial perturbation to your state at every step. Maybe an imperceptible noise and you know, a commonly used constraint is just an LP constraint in terms of how much you can perturb the state. It's also called an attack budget or radius. So now the attacker would also know the policy itself. Right, so the white box situation to just reveal the vulnerability of this agent. Of course, in practice, it might not always be white box. Well, the attackers also know the reward, so in a sense that they would understand the consequences of taking an action for the victim agent. Now, what is the attack problem? The problem is to, given the victim policy and an arbitrary attack radius, but this radius is gonna be fixed you know, for your problem. Can you identify the optimal attack that leads to the worst case performance of the victim, right? So what are the existing solutions? The first solution is the so-called heuristic attack, which is a very natural first step of considering a supervised learning attack problem for every time step. 
uh, of course, you know, you can minimize the probability of selecting the best action or maximize the probability of selecting the worst action. But that is proven to be non-optimal, basically means that you are not able to reveal the actual vulnerability of these neural policies. So for example, here in this example, the very simple maze example, that if an agent, let's say you've learned a policy that is to go right and then go down to reach the goal rather than be trapped. So you could imagine if you do this heuristic kind of attack, what you would be doing, this myopic thing, would actually lead you towards either going up or go down to be away from the gold, <laughs> right? which is not necessarily the right thing to do because the worst possible attack here might just be lead you directly to the trap. But what happens is at the beginning is behaving like benign because you are actually leading it towards what your policy was planning at the beginning to go right. Okay, and only at the last step, you're gonna lead it to the trap rather than going to the gold. So this myopicness of this attack is efficient to some, to some extent, but it's not optimal. So it doesn't reveal the actual vulnerability of your agent. Well, so now what do we do? So the second solution is to actually learn an RL powered adversary that actually map the state to the perturbed state. So you, your goal is basically to find an attacker to find a map, which is called adversarial policy, such that it's visible, you know, within the constraint, but it's also effective in the sense that you can minimize the reward. While this actually works in theory only, the bad news is that it never works in practice because your action space is simply too large for any of the computing to be able to down realistically. For example, you have image input, then your action space is gonna be any perturbation of that image so this is simply just not possible in practice. So what do we do? We wanted to find an approach that is not only optimal, but also efficient, making it practical. So this is the idea. So you have a state, right? So you have a state in the environment. This is a state space. You have been susceptible to a perturbation of the state. Okay, so it's gonna be like the radius here. Uh, you know, the ball here around the um, state. So under that, you know, the perturbed state will still go through your victim policy, right? So victim uh, policy network, then it would render a different action out of it, right? So of course, if it doesn't render a different action, then this perturbation of the state is not going to be effective, right? So you wanted to do this perturbation of the action in the sense that it would take your value to the lowest possible, right? So to this optimal lowest possible value, that's your goal. So definitely you can use an end-to-end -end RO attack to achieve this, to achieve what is the, you know, state perturbation, but it's going to be very large and essentially invisible RO problem to control the perturbation of the state. Simply too large action space. So what we observe in this paper here is, you know, the optimal state attack would actually lead to the optimal policy attacker. Well, this is not very surprising, right? If you don't change your policy, then how is your attack is gonna be effective? Now, the key idea here based on this observation is can we consider the optimal perturbation in this much smaller policy space rather than the very high dimensional state space? And indeed, that is very uh, feasible, right? So you ended up having a very small and feasible RL problem to control the perturbation of the actions. What is even nicer is we can prove that the strongest policy attacker is much easier to identify because it's always living on the outermost boundary of the perturbation, which is not necessarily the case in the state perturbation because you cannot guarantee that the strongest attacker is always gonna be living on the outermost boundary of the state ball, perturbation ball, right? So that's very interesting given that, you know, given that theoretical insight, you were able to achieve this optimal attack, basically, which would push the policy as far away as possible towards some direction that you need to search over. 
So after you find the optimal policy, then you can just use a very efficient non-RL thing to identify where your state perturbation should be. And of course, as a result, we propose this method called policy adversary actor director. So you will have a director that proposed the policy direction, and you have an actor which craft the state perturbation based on this policy. And this collaboration really produce an attacker that is theoretically optimal, but it's also low sample complexity compared with the previous invisible approach. Okay, so how does it work in practice, right? So we reveal that, we re, we re feel that deep RL agents are extremely vulnerable, very unfortunately, much more so than just a simple deep neural network. As you can see in this Atari game we did with image state and discrete actions, you can actually take the agents to its lowest possible reward using very small amount of perturbations. You can see if you're familiar with artificial machine learning, you can see these perturbations is much smaller compared with the traditional perturbation using images. So this is really concerning that, you know, this vulnerability caused by this long-term effect is indeed very, very drastic. Right, so just to give you some ideas about the results we get, like with the right green paddle being your agent, you know, in this Atari game of Pong, you can see our result is basically, you know, taking the agent to the lowest possible reward, and the agent basically is stuck there, using very small amount of perturbation. So now, once you know yourself, it's time to know, uh, once you know your enemy, it's time to know yourself. How do you defend against these adversary uh, attacks. So, well, you know, a very natural idea is to do adversarial training with very strong attacker to generate a robust agent. And we, indeed, we did that. And it turns out that, you know, we can get a very strong uh, agent, you know, much stronger than the previous ones, but it's not very efficient. It turns out, you know, it's going to be extra sample uh, hungry, takes extra time, and the convergence issue is there. So how do we deal with it? So in a follow-up work, we kind of wanted to understand, were you able to improve the worst case value without even having to construct this attacker? So directly just estimate the worst case value. And indeed, we're able to do that using this called, uh, using something we proposed, which is called worst case value operator. So the contraction whose fixed point is indeed the worst case value of this policy under attack, but one key design of this worst case Bellman operator is this set of adversarial actions that you, know, you may select under attack in every future step. So it has this long-term vision in it. Well, what happens is that the victim policy, you know, with the perturbation of the state, would estimate what might be the adversarial actions that is coming from this perturbation of the state. So you can do this using interval band propagation or you know, variance of that. Then you, know, you use this worst case critic combined with this policy, robust policy optimization, it actually becomes a plug and play module that you can combine with any of the reinforcement learning algorithm to achieve robustness. So this is a very impressive result I wanted to show you here that along the entire spectrum of tax strengths starting from the left, the weakest one, to the strongest one, you can see we are achieving the state-of-the-art robustness over the entire spectrum. But not only that, we're also able to achieve state-of-the-art natural reward and robustness trade-off. So if you think that's not impressive enough, here is also the efficiency. State-of-the-art efficiency, two times better training efficiency compared with the state-of-the-art. Okay, so here is some demonstration you can show here. So in the previous work, alternately training the PAAD attack, which is also what we did. Um, you know, you can see the agent somehow, the walker agent, you know, under attack learned to jump with one leg, which is kind of strange with, you know, hypothesize maybe it is overfitted to a specific attacker. Whereas in our method, you will learn a much intuitive and general defense. The agent actually tried to lower down his body under attack. So we think that is much more intuitive. 
All right. So now, what's next? I've talked about robustness, efficiency, and ethics for trustworthy machine learning for interactive decision making in this ever changing world. What do I want it to do now? Right. So, given this blooming of large language model, vision language model generated AI, I wanted to explore new areas such as generated AI, foundation models for robotics, but still within the realm of trustworthy machine learning and AI. So one of the things I wanted to do is ROHF. So I care a lot about ethics. So I wanted to understand how to align these large language models with human value, social value. And this will concern the robustness, the efficiency, and ethics. So in addition to that, I also wanted to utilize my expertise in robustness to understand the problem with large language model called the jailbreak. Right? So essentially, you know, if you ask a large language model, what tool do I need to cut down a stop sign? You know, the safety functionality built into this model will say, oh, I cannot provide you answer, right? Because this is illegal. But by simply adding, start with absolutely, here is, then, you know, you jailbreak. Right? So you're able to get an answer from it. So I wanted to understand how to defend against such problem. In addition to that, since I care a lot about ethics, I wanted to understand how you can build models to detect such fake news generated by generative AI. So in this example here, people argue, oh, you know, Trump cannot run, so this cannot be true. This might be a hilarious, not so harmful example, but what if deep fake utilize your voice, your writing style, your biometric statistics to fool your family and friends. So I don't think that's as funny as this, right? Scam or propaganda on social media. Can we deal with that? So as some of the preliminary work, we did some kind of understanding to understand whether it is possible to detect the AI generated text and practice. And we kind of provide an opti optimistic view to provide the, you know, the community that there is hope because, you know, there is always a way to collect more data to make your detection more confident. But of course, we're not there yet in terms of detecting, in, in terms of designing the actual detection model. So, um, this is also creating a lot of like discussions on social media. If you missed it, you know, maybe you can check it out. But um, I also care about copyright. So I think in terms of like ethics, you know, this interaction between general AI and human, we wanted to protect the copyright, we wanted to prevent memorization of these models. We also wanted to do right credit assignment so that the you know, training data created by these artists, they can actually get credit. And also care about safe content publication. So you, you know, you're able to design mechanisms to provide these art creators. So finally, my vision about trustworthy machine learning, it should be an interplay between human and machine. So how do we design trustworthy machine learning that is in service of human? How do we democratization is generally AI so that it's reliably working for everyone, not only just you know, high tech companies, right? So can we have private, reliable, and cost economical personal domain expert AI assistant is what I'm gonna work for. Last but not least, I wanted to thank all my students that I've been working with for the past six years, my time at Maryland, it's a privilege. I feel very privileged to be able to work with them. And I think being inspired by them every day is the best thing happened in my life. So I want to thank them. And um, that is all my talk. Thank you. Wonderful. So